Okay, I think we can get started. So let me just get started first. So for, for this talk, uh, Clarence is going to do most of the work. So he's going to talk to you about uh, how to get started with your first mining rig. And what we have here is that we have our uh, first mining rig uh, from Singapore. So if you want to take a photo with this mining rig, just uh, go ahead. That will be one Bitcoin per, per photo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about the agenda for this uh, session for the next uh, 60 minutes. So there are four main things that we want to cover for this session. So first of all, we want to talk about, um, just before we do, do that, how many of you actually attended my blockchain uh, talk yesterday? Okay, so I don't have to talk too much about the, the mining process. You already know that the mining process is basically finding the nonce in a, in a block. So now, having understood how blockchain work and what are some of the common cryptocurrencies, we want to now focus on the following topics. We want to focus on how to buy cryptocurrencies, especially for those of you who, have, uh, who are new to cryptocurrencies, who have yet to buy your first crypto. So we will talk about how to buy them. Now, for those of you who do not want to buy crypto, uh, the next best alternative would be to mine the cryptos yourself. So all you need to do is to uh, set up a mining rig like this. You can just buy a, a cheap motherboard with the uh, Pentium CPU, and most importantly, buy a few expensive GPUs. Okay? And you can just set it up and then run it at home or better still in the office, and, and, and then you can <laughs> get your cryptos. Now, um, later on, Clarence will show you how, how to actually run the mining software so that you can actually mine it. And like I mentioned earlier, we have been running this in a, in a hotel room for the past few days. And I think collectively we made about 10 US dollars. Uh, not a big deal, but at least I can buy two bottles of Coke in, in Norway. So uh, last but not least, after you have made all your cryptos, after you have made all your cryptos, uh, we will talk about how to store your cryptocurrencies so that they are safe and secure. Now, how many of you have a hardware wallet with you? I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about this, this wallet. A hardware wallet. Anybody? Uh, let me just show you a hardware wallet. Ah, I didn't bring it here. But do you have hardware uh, wallet? Yes, I do have. Yeah, okay. Let me, get uh, let me just flash a hardware wallet and, and, and show it to you. So uh, this is especially important for those of you who are uh, planning to really go into cryptocurrencies big time you need to have a safe and secure way to save your cryptos. So, so a hardware wallet looks like this. Looks like a thumb drive, where you can actually uh, connect this to your, to your computer, or, or just a, 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 USB, a micro USB cable, and then you can actually save all your cryptos on this thumb drive. And then later on, I'll tell you some, some of the uh, horror stories of people who actually buy this, and then how they, they lose everything on, on, on this this uh, hardware wallet. We'll talk about that later on. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to, to Clarence. He's going to talk about the, how, how to buy cryptocurrencies, how to mine them, and then I'll, I'll follow up with the hardware wallet. Okay, thank you. So a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Clarence. So I'll be talking about, uh, firstly, how to buy cryptocurrencies. So show of hands, over here, anyone own uh, any form of cryptocurrency, be it Bitcoin, Ethereum? Uh, okay, so next question, when did you buy it? When did you buy it? Was it a long time ago? Okay, so you're not rich. <laughs> All right, so I'll be showing you the different types of cryptocurrency out there. So on this screen, there are, these are the so-called the three mainstream cryptocurrencies out there, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. And the prices of it over here is uh, relevant as of 13 June which is on Monday, and it's really a wow ride. So the chart that you're looking at right now is the chart for the previous one year of the performance of Bitcoin, and you have noticed that uh, back in last year, December, it reached its peak at $19,200 US dollars, and as of now, it dropped all the way back to 6005 So, So one thing to, to add on is that in, in, in Korea, so a lot of uh, old folks, they have actually invested in the stock market, and they lost a lot of money in the stock market. So, so what, what they, 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 they look at now is that instead of investing or speculating in the stock market, they look at Bitcoin as a viable option for investing. 
No, it's not investing, it's speculation. So, so all the older folks in, in Korea sold their houses okay, to invest in Bitcoin. And unfortunately, they bought Bitcoin at a very, very high price, something like $19,000 per coin. <laughs> and then suddenly, the Korean government came in and said, no, that is not legal. And, and all those older folks are, are now crying and say, oh, uh, that, there goes my, my, my lifelong savings. So, so, uh, so the important thing is that before you think about uh, selling your house to buy Bitcoin, so you, 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 you've got to consider this, okay? So I always tell people there are only two, two outcomes. Either you can become very, very rich or you will die a poor man if you, if you sell your house and buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Okay so. okay, so next, instead of buying, you can also uh, get, so this is the ways that you can actually get cryptocurrencies. There are three main ways. You can get through cryptocurrency trading, uh, which is where you buy it from someone else, and then you buy it cheap, and then when the price increases and you sell it when it's high. Next, you can do something called cloud mining, where you depend on somebody else to do the dirty work for you uh, in terms of hosting the mining rig and electricity costs as well. If not, if you don't trust anyone, you trust yourself, all you can do is you be like me, you buy a rig and you mine on your own. So let's talk about crypto trading first. So what is crypto trading? Crypto trading is simply buying and selling cryptocurrencies from exchanges such as uh, Coinbase and Binance. So uh, anyone here use Coinbase? Primarily, that, that's the way you guys get your cryptocurrencies, right? Cool. So it's really similar to stock trading, and the idea is to buy it cheap and sell it when the price rise. So buying cryptocurrency. So uh, as I said, the most prominent uh, exchange in this whole world is Coinbase. Uh, why? Because it is trusted by the US federal government, and it has hassle-free transactions. So simply put, if you have a credit card, you can use your credit card to simply make purchase of uh, cryptocurrencies. And however, it requires a, a lot of ID verification. Uh, so they'll use your driving license or your identification for identification uh, for security. And as of now, Coinbase do offer these four mainstream cryptocurrencies, which is Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and Litecoin. So now let's talk about cloud mining. Anyone here tried cloud mining? Or you guys haven't heard of cloud mining before? Okay, cool. So what is cloud mining? Cloud mining is the process of cryptocurrency mining uh, using a remote data center. So as I said, you will require someone else to do the dirty work for you. Uh, someone else will host uh, mining rig farms for you. And all you have to do is to just pay them a, a certain amount of money and in return, they'll pay you a, a return uh, in the form of cryptocurrency daily or monthly. And the good thing is you don't even have to own anything. Uh, you don't have to uh, fork out any money to, to, to buy all the parts. And there's totally no hardware costs, no electrical costs, and there's no, totally no need for any storage space. So there are some trustworthy cloud mining companies out there. Uh, the most prominent one that I would recommend to most of you would be Genesis Mining. So Genesis Mining is a very well-established cloud mining company, and I do have a video to show you more about Genesis Mining. So how do they actually work? So facilities like this, they do usually do operate at very remote areas where the weather is very cold all year round, uh, such as China, Russia, and Iceland. And uh, the primary reason is also because the uh, electrical costs and space rental are really, really cheap. So you wouldn't want to set up a mining farm in San Francisco, for example, because it's really expensive. And to even further uh, enhance their profits, uh, hydroelectric and solar power may come in handy for, for such mining farms. So this is a video on how uh, Genesis Mining actually works. So let's take a look at this very quick video. People often ask me, what's actually the difficulty when building a large cryptocurrency farm? Usually these people have already built a computer, they know the different parts that go in, and the strange thing about it, it's really difficult to answer, because they're completely right. Plugging in all the cables in the right way and putting all the components together is not 
very difficult. The difficulty is earlier than that. The difficulty is how to handle the logistics and the preparation for building a farm of this scale. Hi, I'm Philip Salter. I'm handling mining operations for Genesis Mining here in Iceland. When you're building a cryptocurrency mining rig for your home, you order all the hardware from some online store, you wait for it to be delivered to your doorstep, you unbox all the boxes, plug everything together, and then that's it, you've got one. Now, when you're trying to do this in a very large scale, to build thousands of these machines, that's where things get complicated. The reason is that the usual way of just ordering stuff from online stores breaks apart at, at a certain scale. So if you're trying to order 10 graphics cards, they'll probably be fine. If you try to order you know, 50, some might start saying no. And if you start ordering thousands of them, they won't even believe you. you won't, they won't even reply to your email. So you have to find a different way to source material. Obviously, we're at a large scale, so we're going straight to the manufacturers of the different hardware components. We have a lot of custom hardware. We have lots of stuff that just did not work out for us in the way that it's sold in online stores or any store. And uh, we had to make design our own and have it made. That's of course another dimension of making things more complicated because not just you have to talk to a manufacturer and you know get a shipping date and organize shipping and all this kind of stuff. You have to think about this early enough to design your product, to talk with the manufacturer to make sure he understood correctly what you want, to have him produce it, uh, to then deal with some kind of problems which usually happen, and then deal with the logistics. So the whole time frame for the project is getting larger and larger. Uh, the amount of communication needed for the project is getting bigger and bigger. And people don't see it coming because it's just problems that you're not faced with if you're just um, looking at it from the technical side. These are just real world problems that you get with large scale. And it's something that you have to be on top of from the very beginning, otherwise your entire project will be delayed by a lot. Luckily, we have lots of experience here with these kinds of small, annoying problems. And uh, I'd like to say that at this point, we've kind of seen it all. At least the things that can really go bad have already gone wrong once. So we are extra careful and just basically think about these problems in advance and try to solve them before they even happen. For example, we, we order a couple percent more of everything than we actually need because of course some of them will be faulty, some of them will be broken, some of them will be missing, some of them will be lost or something. The most scary part of a build out is when you're almost done, right? You've done all the major steps, everything seems fine and nothing has gone wrong because at that point you know something's going to go wrong. You just don't know what and when. And the later it is in the build out, the less time you have to fix it, right? So I'd rather have something go wrong in the very beginning and then it's a big problem and you fix it and it takes you a week, but then everything goes smooth. Okay. All right, cool. So what you have seen uh, in, the, uh, in the video earlier on is basically the, exactly the same thing that I have right here, a mine rig, but it's way more, more GPUs. So all the equipment are pretty much the same and the difference is they got more GPU. So how to get started with cloud mining? So Genesis Mining do offer uh, their, their contracts uh, for different cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. And all you have to do is just to simply sign up with them for a contract. And they will probably tell you that, okay, for this contract that you sign, you'll be given a certain amount of hash power. And for this hash power, you'll get back a certain uh, return in cryptocurrency every single day, for example. And yes, so you have to pay an upfront fee and you'll get returns in cryptocurrency. And, but the thing is, for Genesis Mining, their contracts are really, really limited. So you have to stay tuned to their website so whenever they release a new, brand new batch of mining contracts, you must be fast to get your hands on it. If not, uh, you have to wait for the next cycle before they release another new batch of contracts. So this is a very simple uh, cloud mining profitability chart from Genesis Mining. Uh, this is one of the most popular contract that they have sold, is the 845 US dollars, five terahash per second Bitcoin mining contract on Genesis Mining. And if you do a quick math, 
you throw these five tera hashes into, into a calculator, the daily income you'll get is probably about $2. And if you ca calculate the return on investment, it will be probably in around 393 days. And you'll only be at a profit after 393 days. So, sounds great, right? Cloud mining, but there are still risks. So, scammers pose as legitimate cloud mining companies that scams unknowing users. And what are telltale signs? They do offer returns that are unrealistically higher. And their website usually don't provide any form of contact information, or they'll put a fake contact information where if you put throw the address in Google Maps, you'll return to somewhere in the desert, for example. And they'll provide, they'll claim to provide a X amount of hashing or mining power, and they'll have enticing referral benefits so that you will refer more and more of your friends into so-called this scam. So I got con. <laughs> I was one of the unknowing victims back in June 2016, where you know Bitcoin was the buzzword. So when, when you look when you look at look up on YouTube and you see oh Bitcoin is one of the most trending videos out there. So what was my first search? I searched how do I get free Bitcoin? So the first video popped up, and it was a video on this company known as Hash Ocean. Uh, if you search on this on Google right now, this website isn't there because this website is gone. So initially, this website tell, uh, tells that, okay, if you sign up for a free account with us, we'll give you some sort of uh, free hash power where you'll get certain returns daily. But their returns are really, really low. So it probably take one whole month for you to get at least like five or 10 US dollars. So the main point of this website is to make you pay more money to unlock even greater hash power so that, once, so that if you pay a certain amount of money, the more money that you pay, the more hash power that you get in return and you'll get more returns daily on a daily basis. So I took out $300 of mine from my own savings. I took $300 and I sent it to this guy from from Hash Ocean, and I got five dollars, five US, uh, five Singapore dollars, which is around three US dollars daily, and it gave me a payout for for almost thirty to forty days. After that, when I look up on the website, the website was down, and then when I checked my account, there was no payout. So I sent an email to customer support and I asked them, "Hey, what's going on? Why is my..." Why, why am I not receiving my payout as promised? So they say, oh, sorry, our servers are down, probably take a, a few weeks to get back on. So fine, I, wait, I waited for a few weeks and I never got a reply. So at that point in time, I know that I got scammed. And I wasn't the worst guy. I, I, I wasn't expecting the worst because there are some other people who invested 5,000, 10,000, or even their entire savings into this. So that's a very, very important and painful lesson to learn. So I got smart after that. <laughs> so instead of asking someone else tr uh, who are not trustworthy to, to handle your mining for you, why not do it yourself, where you can do hardware mining like me over here? So question is, how easy it is to mine for cryptocurrency? Uh, if you ask this question eight years ago, back in 2009, you can mine for 100 bitcoins using a Pentium 4 PC in just one day. Imagine how rich would you be today? How much is one Bitcoin? One Bitcoin is around 6.5. So imagine how rich would you be today? But as of today, uh, because more miners are joining in the Bitcoin network, so therefore it is much harder to make money using old and outdated hardware. So therefore, you need to get a more powerful hardware to make bigger profits. So crypto hardware mining. So this is the time where you build your own uh, hardware to mine for cryptocurrency. So what are the two main kinds of hardware miner out there? The first kind would be um, what many people would call ASIC miners. They are called application-specific integrated circuit miners. Uh, they are basically miners that do one and only thing, which is to only mine for cryptocurrency. And that's what they do. And next one is GPU miners, which I have right here. Uh, so ASIC miners, what are ASIC miners? They are dedicated mining hardware to mine for cryptocurrencies. 
And to be honest, in the early days of Bitcoin, they are really, really popular. So this company known as N Miner, they do build uh, hard ASIC miners that mines for different kinds of cryptocurrency. And once they announce their hardware, it gets sold out within one day. And but the downside to ASIC miners is that it produces a lot of heat and it is very, very loud. It's way much louder than this. If you think that this is loud, ASIC miners are way much louder. So as of now, as of today, the most uh, hot selling ASIC miner would be the N miner E3. Same is produced by N miner and it specializes in Ethereum mining. So many people would ask, if I buy a uh, ASIC miner that, is, that specializes in Ethereum mining, can I use it for Bitcoin mining? No, because if you understand the fundamentals of Bitcoin and Ethereum, they are built on different uh, tip cryptogra cryptography models. So uh, the answer is no, you cannot use an Ethereum miner to mine for Bitcoin. So some very basic statistics of this N miner, the hash rate is about 180 mega hashes. So one day you will get about $8.58, $8 and the power draw is $2.70 per day. So running this machine, you'll get about $5.80 as a profit every single day. And this machine costs around 2005 if you, if you are able to get your hands on one. I think this is quite good. But there are really problems with ASIC miners out there. Uh, it is only able to mine at a fixed level of mining difficulty. So as I said, when more miners join the Ethereum network, the difficulty increases. So that is a problem with ASIC miners because as of now, when you try to buy an ASIC miner, probably your order will backlog back all the way back to three months. So if you order now, you're only able to get your hardware in three months' time. So by the time you get your hardware, probably you can't even catch up with the mining difficulty. So that's a problem. And therefore, because of such problem, it devaluates as time passes. So every single day that you own your machine, chances are your machine is losing money. And it has no resale value when it, it is underperforming below the current mining difficulty level. So once it, it passed the mining difficulty level, it basically has no use for it. You can't extract it and build parts for your other computers. It's basically useless. And again, it produces a lot of heat and noise. So let's now take a look at GPU miners. So why are GPU miners better? Because GPU miners are essentially parts we use in a desktop PC. Your motherboard, your RAM, your uh, power supply, everything all comes from your normal, regular desktop PC. Uh, just that the only different thing is you will need a more powerful set of GPUs uh, to maximize the algorithm solving hash rate. So benefits, it's really easy to upgrade if the mining difficulty increases. So when the mining difficulty increase and your graphics card are deemed unworthy to, to be profitable, all you can do is simply sell away your existing old graphics card. You can sell it to gamers. Gamers love uh, used graphics cards. You can sell it to them. And then you can use that money that you earn from, from, from your old graphics card and you can buy a brand new set of much powerful graphics card. And you can also use, use it to multi-purpose as a normal desktop PC. So when in, in times where, you where it's summer and you think it's too hot, you can use your mining rig to play Battlefield. You can use it to play PUBG. <laughs> so let's talk about rewards for miners. So in the case of Bitcoin, the initial block was uh, 50, the initial block reward was 50 Bitcoin. And it will halve every 210,000 blocks. So in 2013, it went through its first halving event to 25 Bitcoin. And in 2016, it went through the second one. And now it is currently at 12.5 Bitcoin per block. And it will, get, uh, it will eventually be reduced to zero after 64 halving events. And Bitcoin will, the Bitcoin network will adjust the difficulty of the puzzle so that uh, each block, each new block being mined will take roughly about 10 minutes. And in the case of the Ethereum network, it will take approximately every 14 seconds. So if you're interested, you can always take a look at the Bitcoin uh, block reward halving countdown. So this timer will count down to the next halving event where the 
uh, where the block reward will be reduced to 6.25, right? 6.25 yeah. Bitcoin. 6. Yes. So, essentially, you ask this question, how does a miner actually earn money? So, miner actually gets the revenue from the block reward when the block is successfully solved. So, for example, for every block, there is 12.5 Bitcoin. And you're mining in a, uh, in a mining pool. So you are mining together with a pool of people where they are, where they are fighting for, to, to solve the block. And for that 12.5 Bitcoin, it will be divided uh, fairly amongst all the, all the miners in the, network, in the mining pool. And Bitcoin has a finite supply. It will stop adding new coins to the network uh, once it reaches 21 million coins. So after that, how do miners earn money then? So miners will only be able to earn something called transaction fees. So for example, you are making a transaction to your friend. So A to B, you are sending a certain amount of Bitcoin to your friend. So within the amount that you send, a certain amount will go to the transaction fee. And that fee will be paid to all the miners who are helping you mine that transaction. So factors that actually affect your earnings. So the first factor would be price of crypto coin. So the higher the value, the more money you earn, definitely. And increasing mining difficulty, which I've mentioned earlier, which is when more miners come in into the network and fight with each other, uh, the higher the difficulty and resulting in less amount of crypto mine within the same period of time. So this is the current Ethereum mining difficulty. And if you, have look, if you look at uh, January 17 onwards, it has increased, increasing steadily. And you guys might be wondering what happened in September, October. So that is what we call a hard fork. So where Ethereum, the Ethereum developers decide to change the, some, some of the rules, and therefore the mining difficulty has dropped significantly. But from October onwards, it went on steadily. And as of now, if you can see, the mining difficulty is pretty, pretty high. So let's get started with building our mining rig. So this is how uh, the mining rig actually interacts with the entire network. So you will have to choose a mining pool. So a mining pool will be able to give you all the rewards, the block rewards. And after getting the reward, where do you store them? So you store it in a Ether wallet. So we'll go into greater depth later on. So building a three GPU rig. If you're interested in my rig, this is the components that I have. This is the same components that I have. And one thing that many people would ask is that, do I need a high-end CPU for mining? The answer is no. Because for everything, for all the hashing that you actually do, it's all done on the GPU side. So you can use a very, very old CPU. If you have an Intel Core 2 Duo, you can actually use it. But in my case, I'm using a Intel Pentium, which is more than enough for a mining rig. So, so just, just a quick check. How many of you have actually mining rigs in your, in your home? Anybody? Uh, he, he has one. One. <laughs> so how many GPUs do you have? Eight. Eight. Wow. Do you want three more? Sorry. Do you want three more? <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about the rest? Anybody running a mining rig at home? So, OK. Cool. So the total cost is around, is slightly shy of 1,005 US dollars. And many people ask this question, if I want to build a GPU mining rig, which GPU brand should I choose? AMD or NVIDIA? Uh, any NVIDIA fans over here? Who, who, anyone likes NVIDIA GPUs? Ah, uh, I see one guy. Ah, uh, I'm an NVIDIA fan as well. So. Uh, AMD versus NVIDIA. In cryptocurrency world, which is better? So it all comes down to what kind of cryptocurrency you want to mine. So in my case, I decided on mining Ethereum. So, and I know that AMD specializes in Ethereum mining. So I went ahead with AMD. My graphics card is the RX 570, if you're interested. So AMD card specializes in Ethereum and Monero mining. And you can do a lot of BIOS tweaking, and it has less driver updates. But the thing about AMD is that it consumes a lot of power, and it produces a lot of heat. 
But compared to NVIDIA, NVIDIA you can use it to mine for Bitcoin, Litecoin, all those. And it has better power consumption management, and it has a better thermal management as well. And these are all the GPU model variations that we have out in the market. So uh, if you go to a mining rig shop and you tell them that, oh, I want to get some GPUs, chances are they will offer the list of GPUs over here to you for you to choose. And if you, uh, if you want to build a very powerful mining rig as of now, I would definitely recommend you the RX 570 and 580 if you are mining on Ethereum. And if you want to mine on Bitcoin, the best cards out there would be the 1070 and the 1080 Ti. Uh, they do cost quite a lot, but in return, when, when they mine for the cryptos, I think it's quite worth it. So, configuring your miner, what do you actually need? Once you get your, all your hardware, how do we actually configure our miner to get started with mining? So, first things first, you need to have a GPU overclocking software. You need to choose a mining pool. You need to have a mining software that actually mines in the mining pool and ultimately choosing your own preferred wallet to store the cryptocurrencies that you mine. So I'll be showing you, uh, instead of showing you slides, why not I show you the rig that I have. Okay, so this, I, I've remote logged in into my remote, uh, into my mining rig. So this is what you actually see when you get started with mining. So this screen over here, this is the mining software. I'm using Claymore Miner. This miner mines Ethereum, and it will show you the statistics of your rig. So if you have three GPUs, they will show you that, oh, you have three GPUs and your total combined hash rate uh, and your temperature so that you can monitor your temperature of your GPUs as well. And we also have something called the uh, overclocking software. And the one I'm using is MSI Afterburner. So this software allows you to do crazy things with your GPU. You can change the core voltage. You can control the speed of the fans. So in hot weather, you can choose to max out your fan speed so as to cool your systems. Can you try that now? Uh, sure. On the so just pay attention to the sound of the mining rig. So I'm going to ch change this to 40. And then I change this. So what I'm doing right now is I'm changing the speed of the fans for all three GPUs. So have you heard the difference in the sound? Yep. Yes. So just now, the sound that was, you're hearing that's so loud, I'm running it at max speed. So currently, I'm running it at uh, 40%. Cool. So let's go back to the slides. So what this does, what the overclocking software does is it allows you to overclock the, the GPUs to maximize its mining capabilities. And at the same time, it allows you to do something that is very important, which is known as undervoting. Uh, undervoting allows you to reduce, further reduce the power draw of your graphics card. And in the long run, it will save you a lot, a lot of electric, uh, electrical bill. And this is the mining software. This is the Claymore Miner. Uh, it's free to download, and it's really, really easy to configure. So uh, talking so much about mining pools, you might be wondering, what is the best mining pool out there that I can choose? Uh, these are all the mining pools that are available for, Ether for the Ethereum network. And for me personally, I would like to choose the, the mining pool with the highest combined hash rate, uh, which is Ethermine. And you want to say anything? No, it's okay. Okay. So this is the distribution of reward uh, in a mining pool. So you might say, oh, how does the... the uh, so, so when my mining pool actually mine for one block and I get the, the reward, how is it shared amongst all the miners in the mining pool network? So for example, in, in this scenario, I have a mining pool that has a total combined hash rate of 400 mega hashes, and the reward is for Ethereum. So one guy over here has, um, has a mining rig that is twice as powerful as the, the rest of the, his, his competition. And in return, when they get the reward, reward of four Ethereum, uh, this guy with, a power, with the more powerful mining rig will get two Ethereum in return, where the rest of the competition will only get one. So this is the very simple analogy of how the reward is being distributed. 
So let's talk about calculating Ethereum mining profitability. So make a guess. Before I even show you the slides, anyone want to make a guess how much, uh, how long would you get the return on investment for my rig? Anyone want to make a guess? You? Six months? Okay, I've been mining this rig for 200 days and I've just reached only 40% return on investment. So that is a very long time. And you want to see the statistics? It will scare you. So I'm using a... It is, it's mining at 82 mega hashes. Daily income of only $4. And this is the power consumption is 0 0.465 kilowatts. And in Singapore, this is in Singapore dollars. So in Singapore, this is the rate of our electrical charge is by kilowatt hour, it's 21 cents. And if you multiply it, it will result in 11 kilowatt hours. And if you multiply by the rate, the electrical rate, it will cost you a whopping $2.41 per day. So when you're running this rig, it's using up $2.41 every single day. But the best place to actually run your mining rig is your hotel room. <laughs> so, <laughs> or your office. So the profit that you have is $1.69 $1 every single day. And what's the ROI? 1,065 days. I've built this rig with a very constrained budget of $1,800. And this is the number of days that I'll get to uh, getting back my uh, initial return on investment. So 1,000 days is really insane. And you'll only be profitable after 1,000 days. So that's crazy. All right, so I've done the demo. So I'll pass on the time to Wei Ming. He'll talk to you more about storing cryptocurrencies. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, after doing all the various hard work of um, trying to, to mine cryptocurrencies, I think the next step would be, how do you actually store your cryptocurrencies? So in order to store them, you need what we call crypto wallets. So there are three primary types of crypto wallets. One is what we call cloud wallets. So a, a good example of cloud wallet is your Coinbase, where you actually buy Bitcoin, you buy Ethereum, you buy Litecoin. And basically, what cloud wallets do is they actually hold your private key. They are the ones securing your private key, and you basically trust, you put your trust on all these uh, cloud providers to keep your private key secure. Now, the next type of crypto wallet is what we call desktop wallets. So desktop wallets, a good example is your uh, MetaMask extension. Remember, in my talk yesterday, I talked about uh, installing the MetaMask where you actually can create an account, you can buy eaters, you can get free eaters. So basically, your MetaMask is your desktop wallet. It stores your, your, your private key on your local machine. So that's the second type. So the third type is what we call the hardware wallet, and we sometimes call this keychain wallet. Now, so what is a crypto wallet? So a crypto wallet is basically a software that helps you to store your private and public keys, and it interacts with the various blockchains to enable users to send and receive uh, cryptos. And it allows you to, to make transactions, accept payments, so on and so forth. Now, let's talk about cloud wallet. When you sign up for a uh, Coinbase account, you can create an, an account, and you can actually, uh, so Coinbase would actually store your private key. So what's the problem with using a cloud wallet? You are placing all your trust on a cloud provider. And what happens if Coinbase got hacked? If Coinbase got hacked, there goes your cryptos. So somebody would be able to actually get your private key and transfer your, 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 your cryptos to another account, and that's it. There's nothing you can do about that. Okay? And, and usually when I talk about this, there is always a question that people uh, would, would like to ask, and I'd like to ask you that question back. Now, assuming that you have um, a Coinbase account, and tomorrow morning when you wake up, suddenly there are 500 bitcoins in your account. Somebody has transferred 500 bitcoins into your account. What would you do? 
Again? Uh, change your keys, uh, move it to another account, uh, and then, okay, move it to another account, yes, and then? Cash out. Cash out. Who says you will cash out? <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are thinking about that, cash out. Don't. Don't cash out. Why? The moment you cash out, you reveal your identity. Right? If you cash out, for example, you cash out through Coinbase. And what happens if that 500 bitcoins were stolen? Stolen from somebody, and somebody used that, used your account as an as a intermediary and transferred that 500 accounts to you. So the moment you cash out that 500 bitcoins, uh, you will get into legal problem. If they were to trace and say, hey, you are the one who actually coin cash out that 500 tokens, uh, 500 bitcoins. So what's the next best solution? By Monero, <laughs> where it's totally uh, anonymous, okay? So, so there is no right and wrong answer. So I think the best answer would be don't do anything. Wait for the world to forget about you, right? And then before you cash out. Now, <laughs> so, and also that you have less privacy as federal government have rights to see your transactions. Now, in the past, uh, Whatever things you have in your Coinbase account, uh, the US government has got no rights to know. But recently, I'm sure you have heard of this, the IRS is asking Coinbase to submit a list of uh, user accounts. So the IRS is gonna tax you based on the amount of cryptocurrency that you have in your, in your wallet. So that's cloud wallet. How about desktop wallet? So I, I use the example of a desktop wallet, which is your MetaMask extension. There are a lot of other desktop wallets. So, um, so you basically, your computer stores that private key. But I'm sure you have heard a lot of horror stories about storing your private key on your local computer. Have you heard, heard of this story where this guy, he said that many, many years ago, he was doing Bitcoin mining in his house. And then his girlfriend got very upset with him. So his girlfriend doesn't like him turning on his machine 24-7 because it's noisy, it's warm, makes the house really, really hot. And his girlfriend wanted him to stop mining. So he listened to his girlfriend. And well, it could, it could happen to your boyfriend as well. But. <laughs> so this guy, he stopped mining. And then after a while, he realized that his machine was a little bit too old. He got a few bitcoins. I think it was like something like 50 bitcoins. And he threw away his computer. And he threw away his computer. Until recently where he realized that the, the, the price of one bitcoin is 19,000 US dollars. Only then did he realize that, ah, oh, I got to find my machine back. I got to find my hard drive back. Okay, but it's too late. So I think his uh, hard drive is in some rubbish dump. And I think he's trying to get people to actually help him to go to the rubbish dump and, and find his hard drive. Seriously. So what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the story? Don't listen to your girlfriend. To your girlfriend. <laughs> so. um, no, let me take back my words because I still want to be alive after this session. So, so. so the, the, the moral of the story is that uh, always make a backup copy of your, your private key. Um, but that's not the best solution because backup will usually got screwed up sometimes. So the next best solution would be to buy a keychain uh, hardware wallet. So uh, there are a few hardware wallets available. So you can go to Amazon to, to buy all these wallets. So what I have here is a Nano Ledger S which costs US $99. And you have your Trezor, you have your KeepKey. So, uh, we, we, we read all the different reviews on the web and it seems like uh, Nano, S, Nano Ledger S is one of the best. So let me explain to you how it works. Now, basically, basically, it keeps track of your private key. So this guy will actually maintain your private key. So your private key is not on the cloud, your private key is not on, on, on some computers, it is on this physical device. Now, I, I know you, you have this, this thinking now. So if I keep my private key on this device, what happens if I lose this device? So it's even more dangerous than losing a computer, right? So now, 
So unfortunately, it is more secure than what you think. So how does it work? So this ledger is designed around two protocols called BIP39 and BIP44. And BIP stands for Bitcoin Improvement Protocol. Now, the first time you buy this device, you, you, you unbox it, when you power up this device, this device will show you on the screen, there is a screen here, there's a small little LED screen here. It will show you 24 key phrases out of a total of 200 and 2048. It will show you 24 key phrases. Now, the first thing you need to do is to record that 24 words, uh, normal English words. Record that 24 words on a piece of paper and lock up your piece of paper in, your, in the safest place in your house or lock it up somewhere, okay? So once you have that 24 words key phrase, even if I lose this device, even if I lose this device or um, I forget this password or uh, the pin code for, for this, pass, this device, I can still recover my private key, okay? So again, uh, I'm not too sure whether you have heard of this, this story of this guy. He was trying to buy this ledger from one particular online uh, website. Of all places, he bought it from eBay. He bought it from eBay. So when he received this ledger, he was so excited, he opened up the box, and that 24 words was printed on a piece of paper. Okay? He got a 24, piece, uh, 24 words on a, printed on a piece of paper, and then he proceeded, he, he, he went on to actually transfer all his Bitcoins, Ethereum, all onto his ledger. Okay? And guess what? A few months down the road, one morning when he wake up, everything is gone. Why? Because the guy who actually sold him that, this wallet, he has already printed out the 24 words. He has got, got a copy of the 24 words. And so he sells it to you, and he will say, thank you very much for putting bitcoins into this. And he would just get by another ledger. He can do a recovery using that 24 words. So when I punch in that 24 words into my ledger, I get hold of all the accounts that you have all the private keys that you have, and I could easily transfer all the Bitcoins that you have onto another uh, ledger. And that's it. Um, there's nothing you can do about that, and, and all your Bitcoins uh, are gone. Now, how, how does it actually work? Now, I have a very simple uh, diagram to show you. So initially, when you, when you set up this device, it generates 24 key, 20 word, uh, a series of 24 words, uh, key phrases, and it actually combines with a empty passphrase. The first time you set it up is empty passphrase. And you basically supply uh, a pin code to actually secure your device. And this 24 words plus the empty passphrase, they actually generate a seed, and this seed generates a root key. And this root key is used to generate your private public key pair. So does it make sense? So even if you were to lose your ledger, or if one day this is non-functional, uh, non-functioning, you can just buy one, punch in the 24 words, and it will automatically generate um, the seed the plus the root key, and you will be able to recover all the all, all, all the accounts that you have, and your, your Bitcoin would be back. But that's one problem. So having said that, uh, I have some Bitcoins here on, on this device, and what is going to happen to you if somebody knows that you have Bitcoins inside there, what are they going to do to, 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 to you? They probably take a, a knife, point it at you, give me your pin. And so you have to release your pin. The moment you release the pin, it will take the 24 words. Uh, you don't even need to have the 24 words. You, you, you take the pin, and then you can basically unlock your, your account. So this device has got an additional security feature. This device allows you to actually create a secondary account, so to speak. So what you do here is that 
when you first set up your ledger, you will put some bitcoins, for example, into this primary account. So that if one day you are robbed under uh, a gunpoint, you, you, you can just give your pin to the robber. And the, why? Because if you don't give the pin, the, 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 the robber will just beat you up and, and probably kill you. So, so um, there's no excuse for telling the robber that, oh, I forgot my pin number. That, that's not logical, right? So you will give them the pin number. So they take this pin number, they unlock it, and say, ah, oh, you only have 0 0.0001 Bitcoin, so that's worthless. So where do you actually store your real Bitcoin? You create another account. You create another account, and I create another pin, and I associate this pin with a new passphrase. You can generate any words you want. So for example, you want to generate this second, secondary account with this pin number, one, two, three, four, five, with a word that you choose. For example, durian. Do you know what is durian? If you, if you go to Singapore, you will find this fruit that it smells like gas. Anyway, so you put in a, 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 a new passphrase, and once you do that, it will generate another account for you. And this is the place where you store all your real Bitcoin. If you have 20 Bitcoins, this is the place to, to store your Bitcoin. So using this approach, even if one day somebody knows about your 24 words key phrase, they could only retrieve back your primary account. And your secondary account is still secure. And the, the only way to recover this secondary account is to actually supply the new passphrase, which you yourself know. So when you have these two types of account, the primary one to store just a little bit of Bitcoin so that in case you are robbed, you can just give the robber your primary account. And the secondary account is the one where you actually st store all your real Bitcoins or your e ether or whatever. Okay, so, so this is how it works. So, so when it's first turned on, uh, it generates the 24 words plus the passphrase. And then you supply a four to eight digit pin, uh, which is known as the mnemonic um, extension to secure the device. So if your device is uh, lost or stolen, your account can be fully restored using another ledger device, or you can go to this website called myeaterwallet.com. So uh, something for you to, to take note, so the easiest way uh, or the safest way to store your, your cryptocurrencies would be to store it onto a hardware ledger, a hardware wallet, okay? So how many of you have a hardware wallet? No, nobody? So, so where, where do you store your cryptos? Uh, I have a uh, you have a, okay, okay. How, how, about, the, how about the rest? There are, there are people who are, who are doing mining, right? Tell me where you store your cryptos so that I can try something back in my hotel room later on. So blockchain. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I think uh, that, that's all we want to, to cover. So if you have any questions, we will be around. So if you want to take a look at the mining rig or you want to have some, you have some questions to ask, Clarence, please feel free to, to come up to the, to the front and then we, we, we can have a chat. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.